You're listening to What She Said, a podcast about blogging, creativity and life online hosted by me, Lucy Lucraft, a freelance journalist and blogger based in Brighton. You know when you get in from a walk and you're super close to wetting yourself and you try to get your coat, bag and shopping immediately off so you can go to the loo but you can't because you're entangled in your headphones. That feeling is the worst. <laughs> so hallelujah to Studio Sweden who make the dreamiest looking wireless headphones on the planet. They're stylish, that's kind of Studio's thing, easy to use and great value too. I've been using the Studio Tray set, which I paid for myself last year, but I now have the excellent Regent model, which, true to Studio's ethos, are both stylish and damn good quality. As well as being able to connect wirelessly to my phone and laptop, Regent comes with an auxiliary cord to plug into my computer for podcasting too. To get your pair, head to studio.com and get 15% off with the code what she said. And even better, shipping is free worldwide as standard. So go show them some love for helping me make this podcast for you. So that's 15% off with the code what she said. Hi Sass, welcome to the podcast. Welcome back to the podcast. Hello Lucy. It's lovely to be here. Really well. Really Good. well. So for anybody who doesn't know who you are, and I'm sure everybody who listens to the podcast does, can you just introduce yourself, tell us what you do, why you do it, and why you're sure. here? <laughs> sure. Um, so I'm Sass Petherick. I'm, uh, I was born in New Zealand, but I live in Bristol, and I've lived in the UK for many, many years. My parents were from the northeast of England, so I have a really good, healthy, working, uh, working-class chip on my shoulder. It's great. <laughs> Um, and I am a coach and a mentor for other coaches. Um, my my kind of area of interest, my flavor of this work is around self-doubt. And I have a master's degree in mentoring and coaching from Oxford. And my dissertation was a exploration of the experience of self-doubt. And it helped me to kind of put together some pieces of my own story. And it's kind of held my attention. And so... Uh, these days I run a few group courses and I work one-to-one and I do some workshops and retreats uh, all around self-doubt, how it shows up, how we respond to it, the sort of patterns and tendencies that come with it, um, and really just helping people to navigate through it and come out the other side because I kind of feel like everyone's got shit to do and self-doubt <laughs> kind of gets right in the way. So, um, so yeah, that's that's the... That's the part of the patriarchy I am bringing down. <laughs> <laughs> and I love that. And um, there'll be stuff in the show notes, links to relevant content in the show notes. And one of the links will be to your archetype quiz, which I found to be revelatory, which um, I'm sure everybody listening to the podcast has done it. But if they haven't, then they should. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so glad you enjoyed it. Yeah, that, that's been like a sort of project over the last year to try and see if there were patterns or themes that show up in self-doubt. And I'm kind of blown away. I don't know if this happens to you, Lucy, but you always kind of think when you're creating something, you never quite know how it's going to be received. But over three and a half thousand people have done the quiz. That's amazing. Like I just find that insane. But I'm thrilled as well. Yeah, I mean, yeah. it's amazing. It doesn't surprise me at all because... I, I think the things that people were saying were all so, so similar, which was, sass, get out of my brain. Yeah. <laughs> Scarily yeah. accurate. Um, yeah, a few people have asked me if I'm a witch, and I'm really not. <laughs> but I do fundamentally believe in the process of good research. And so um, if if you feel like I'm in your brain, it's just because you're not alone and so many other people that I have worked with or have um, have like uh, taking their sort of data points, their their comments, their experiences into account. Um, it just means you're not alone, and that this is this is a thing. So um, yeah, I'm I'm kind of excited that that people are interested in this and um, and that are kind of taking it on board, and it's helping folks to sort of move through it a little bit. Mm. So it's a it's a t- tricky old business, self doubt. Yeah, isn't it? Um, so one of the things I wanted to talk, well, the the thing, the thing, the big thing that I wanted to talk to you about today was about coaching, because I think you straddle a really interesting position in that you are a coach for creatives or a coach for humans uh, yeah. with self-doubt. Um, and also you are a mentor for 
other coaches. Yeah. Which is quite an interesting, an interesting position to be in, I think, because you're essentially being kind of like the th- if anyone's ever done therapy, they know that their therapist has to have a supervisor to kind of keep them on track and deal with their crap, you know, and, and keep things ethical and all the rest of it. And it's a really good practice to have a coach if you're coaching somebody else. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I know that it's not a legality or anything, but so I, I wanted to talk to you about this specifically because the idea for this podcast episode was sparked from a Twitter chat between a few of us about whether you should have a qualification to be a coach. And at the time, and it wasn't even that long ago, I don't think, like maybe six weeks, something like that, um, maybe less, I felt kind of staunchly, well, no, I don't think that's right because uh, for lots of reasons. But I've now kind of come out the other side in a way and and now think, actually, you know what? I don't want to be coached ever again unless it's with somebody who has professional qualifications. And I know lots of people listening will, will be like, nope, you're wrong. But from my point of view, I've been coached twice now. Um, and neither times the person was professionally qualified. And I would say that both times I would good and bad experiences but overall I would say I wouldn't go back to those people so the common denominator to me is probably and my boundary is that I think that coaches should have qualifications and so I wanted to talk to you about this and have get your take on things and also get your tips on what somebody who's in a position like I am now or or like I was, should be looking for in a coach? So I would say that this is the most excited I have been about a podcast interview in some time. Um, I think this is a debate that is, it's um, under-discussed and um, there's a lot of defensiveness and fear and judgment-y sort of feelings that come up about talking about things like this and I think we just need to get over it because um, the reality is that the coaching industry is utterly unregulated. There are no minimum standards that any coach needs to meet Um, and there is no requirement for training. There's no requirement for mentoring or supervision for any coach and yet I am finding and I found this over the last sort of seven, eight years that I've been doing this work that more and more people that are seeking out coaches are doing so and they are bringing their whole selves with them and unless we as coaches know how to hold that stuff and and holding it can also be about boundaries, right? What is therapy? What is coaching? Mm -hmm. But unless we know how to do that, and that is not, I don't believe that is an innate skill. I think some of us are perhaps more natural at it than others, but I think that from an ethical perspective, because we are operating in the wild, wild west of no standards or qualifications or training required, it is a beholden of coaches who, if you're dedicated to this work, need to take this stuff seriously because coaching is not benign. It can injure people. Um, And I see this a lot in the world (laughs) that I operate in. Um, And I think there's a number of reasons um, why we end up in this, why we've ended up in this place. But I just want to also reassure anyone who is, who is thinking about engaging with a coach or who is a coach that there are some excellent practitioners out there in the world and not all of them are qualified as coaches. Right. I know a number of coaches who have come to this work through um, social work training, for mm. example, or from from therapy. Um, but I think if you are new to the talking therapies and that whole general pot of things, um, then you will be doing yourself and your clients and your work a disservice by not taking your training seriously, mm. in my opinion. Yeah, I 
Yeah, I completely agree. I couldn't agree more um, with everything you said, and especially, especially that it's not. It should never. You should never feel. It's very easy for me to say this because I'm not a coach, but also I don't feel like anyone should ever feel shame if they are a coach and they're not qualified. Because, like you say, um, firstly, it's not an innate thing that anybody knows how to hold space for people and keep them keep them safe with proper respectful boundaries that's not an innate thing it's a learned quality Mm -hmm. and you can still be a brilliant coach without being qualified but there's a but I think Mm. Mm. (laughs) and I think that but is really uh, how seriously you want to take other humans Mm. life because that's that is what it is I I think there's so much emotion that you are so vulnerable when you're with a coach Um, well and and a lot of the it, it, it's interesting because I'd like to talk about this from the kind of client's perspective and then maybe talk about it from the coach's perspective, mm. if that feels good to you, Liz. Yeah, definitely. Um, so from a client's perspective, it, the thing is, right, that coaching is a is a pretty catch-all phrase. And because there's no requirements or standards or training or anything, there's no like, um, there's no minimum standard anyone needs to meet, um, anyone can literally call themselves a coach, stick out a flash website, do some good marketing, and they're up and running, literally. Mm. Um, and I think from a client's perspective, um, it's helpful to know that um, you're entering you, – what you may be entering into is a really, really slick marketing um, spiel, mm. Right. And that's okay. Right. Cause we've all got to put words around stuff where, you know, where the, the competition for attention is probably the biggest thing that everyone who is online or in the world right now, um, that is, I think, the biggest source of competition or scarcity is our attention because so we're splitting it in so many different directions. And I am, and I really encourage the coaches that I mentor with, um, to be very clear and brief about what they do and how they do it so that they can capture someone's attention so they can self select. But I think from a client's perspective, if you are looking to engage with a coach, um, it, it's really kind of important that you take into account that you are entering into the wild, wild west. Like there is a huge spectrum of um of work that is out there that's offered by coaches and this is you know it, it's from the kind of mentoring end of things where it's much more about um this is my experience and I can show you how to do it by showing you what I know so and, and a lot of that kind of falls into the sort of business coaching world and training and things like that where it's sort of um it's almost like training it's kind mm. of follow my formula and and I can help you create xyz result potentially Um, And then, you know, at the other end of the spectrum, you've got more of the sort of work that I guess I do, which is um, much more um, therapeutic based and has uh, elements of therapy in there. And it's much more about I'm going to show you some um, some tools and some resources and help you to overcome some kind of uh, psychological barrier. Um, which is much more on the therapy end of things. And I should say, I'm also, I also trained as a therapist. So, and I continue to, um, engage in continuing professional development around that because I saw very early on if I wanted to work in this, in this area that I needed that additional, um, knowledge and experience and work in my, in my repertoire. But for someone who is doing the kind of training end of things, then actually them having coaching qualifications, I think is probably going to be the cherry on top. Mm. Um, But what I would say is that one of the reasons why training isn't as um, useful potentially to clients as coaching is because it's a, it's a kind of a follow the formula and I think one of the reasons why people find it difficult to sort of follow a formula or, or just, you know, go through these, you know, go through these steps and you too can have what I have. That kind of coaching, mentoring, whatever we want to call it, training, um, doesn't take into account the reasons why you can't do that in the first place. Mm. Right. Cause it's why many of us struggle to make changes after we read a self help book. 
we might feel inspired, right? We might feel really inspired and think, oh, that makes so much sense. This person is really talking to me. But it may not actually result in some behavioral change or us being able to embody the thing we're inspired to do because that is a is a much more complex and trickier um, experience. And it probably won't be addressed in that kind of follow my formula approach. So, so I think it's really helpful to just kind of look at, well, what is, what is it that I need? What is it as a client or a potential coaching client? What is it that I really want here? And how am I going to know that that person is, um, is able to help me? And so recognizing that, um, what someone says they might be able to do versus what they are actually able to do, um, will, there'll be clues to that as you read through, um, their website copy, as you get to know them on social media, um, having a conversation with a person is a great idea as well before you engage with them. Um, but I think often what happens, and, and I've talked to clients a lot about this, where they'll see someone that they think, I just want to be you, mm. and then that's why they're following them, right? Mm -hmm. And so in this world of um, of having an online business, um, there is a sort of uh, formula, I guess, to that, which is build an audience and then sell them stuff. Yeah. And so if you're following someone who appears to have the life you want or is um, – you know, having uh, experiences that you want, the things that your heart's longing for, and you see that in a person, and then they suddenly say, hey, come by my course, I can do this too, I can help you do this, then it, it, to me, it makes absolute sense why we would be tempted to do that. Yeah. Because most of us actually really want a quick fix. Yeah. Right? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> me included. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't want to have to do the hard work of looking at where I might be not taking responsibility for myself or where I might be, um, you know, denying my emotions or all of that messy, icky stuff. Bugger that. If you're going <laughs> to offer me a quick fix and it's, you know, a hundred bucks, then I have so much sympathy, empathy, and, you know, I'm, I'm with you on wanting that. And who hasn't, you know, purchase something or engaged with um, someone who um, is in the coaching space for exactly that reason. Um, and so I think, you know, the denial of complexity is the first sign, right? <laughs> <laughs> the denial of complexity is the first sign that you are entering into a relationship with someone who may not be able to hold your own complexity. Mm. Oh, yeah, 100%. And I have to say that with 100% clarity, the and I can say this because I did my, ta my uh, taxes very, very early, my accounts really early this year, the amount of money that I've spent on coaching and courses, because I wanted to have a shortcut, A, for sure, but also because I don't want to delve into all the ickiness of myself. And I would much rather just be that person that I'm buying something off. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and, and I, I'm also on the side of someone who offers courses and has offered coaching in the past. And I can tell you that number one, because I'd quite like to talk about this as well. I went down the coaching route as in blog coaching, coaching bloggers, and it wasn't coaching, it was training. Mm -hmm. um, because I thought and was encouraged to, or, or it's difficult to say I was encouraged because I don't know if that's right, actually. I, I thought it was just a really good way to make money from, yeah. from how, from what I knew. Okay, <laughs> I, I'm not going to make money from blogging. I don't want to monetize my blog in that way. I, don't want to offer a course this was before my courses so why don't I be a coach I've seen yeah. lots of people doing that on Instagram I'll just do that it looks quite easy I'll just put up a sales page target other bloggers um and they'll pay me and I'll I don't know what I'll do with them because I've got absolutely no qualifications in any kind of teaching or coaching or anything <laughs> yeah I mean what am I doing I'm just p having a Skype chat with somebody how hard can it be, right? Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, easy. Yeah, yeah. Well, and I think, um, I think that th this is the thing to also remember is that I would say almost anyone who comes into coaching um, work who who 
wants to claim that title for themselves is doing it from a really good place, right? They are doing it because they want, genuinely want to help people. Yeah. There's nothing like this, the feeling of thinking, wow, I just spent some time with a person and I helped them to do something that they couldn't do before that conversation. Like we get a huge amount of emotional and um you know, psychological, even spiritual fulfillment, creative fulfillment from doing that. It helps us feel connected. It helps us feel like we're doing something worthwhile. You know, all of that good stuff. That's why, that's why we put ourselves through it, right? Yeah. So, um, so I think most, most coaches will absolutely come from a place of wanting to help. And I would say that that is a, a fantastic value to have, and it's probably the fun, you know one of the foundations of of entering into this work. What I would say, and I think something that kind of came up during that that little Twitter chat was that what that's like though is when and someone who was in that conversation, I think was a marketing coach or something like that, and she said. Um, but I, I just, I, I help people with their marketing. And so I don't really think I need to have any like coaching qualifications because what I'm really doing is just telling them how to market. And I, my response to that is always, well, one of the reasons that people don't market is because they, um, like most of us, we have a problematic relationship with visibility. Mm -hmm. um, we may question our worth. We may question um, whether we're doing anything that is original or different or that feels good to us, particularly when we're first starting out. And that could be tied back to experiences of, you know, feeling rejected or abandoned. And so what you actually find is that when you're teaching someone their marketing stuff, what you're really doing is teaching a whole person that has lived for a number of decades and has a ton of experiences and reasons why they have sought you out. That may not be apparent right at the start of that, that relationship. But as you get to know someone, you realize that perhaps one of the reasons they aren't able to um, uh, take action on the things that you're discussing in coaching sessions is because of all this other stuff. Having those coaching qualifications, that training, the ability to ask the right question in the right way, you know, is actually going to be the cherry on top that will set you apart from every other marketing coach out there. Yeah. Because you are not just teaching someone, you know, subject matter. Um, you don't just have subject matter expertise. You also have this ability to help folks to actually do it. So, you know, that is a, that is a, you know, that will set you apart. That means mm. your clients are going to have better experiences. They'll tell their friends, you build a business that way, right? And you're doing it because of your coaching ability, because of your subject matter expertise. And I think that's such a interesting and important distinction to make when when you're looking for a coach as well, because um, you might be looking for somebody for something uh, specific, something task task orientated, which in your head you think, OK, they I, I can see that they're they can do this. Well, you know, yeah. may, maybe even oh, is this is kind of a two pronged comment I guess I'm trying to say it, like it, it just because it's a practical thing that you want to learn that doesn't mean that the person doesn't need to have training in in how to teach you yeah how to do that practical skill exactly exactly and I think this is the thing is if you have had some training in coaching skills that is just going to give you a whole um a whole range of resources and tools that you can use to help your clients. Mm. So if you're coming from this place of wanting to help people, then this just allows you to do that better. Mm. And, and I think what can happen is, um, and I certainly found this, was when I was, because I was a management consultant for 15 years before I became a coach. And um, I worked with mostly men in science and technology and, uh, yeah, I, mostly IT projects, government-led projects. Um, they They were quite sort of, Sciency in their orientation. God knows why, because I'm crap at science. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but anyhow, I, um, I would lead, um, often quite big teams of mostly men in, 
um, in that kind of in that kind of environment. And we were often working on big risky projects that had you know massive budgets and lots of you know ministers in Parliament promising things without checking the timelines of our plan. <laughs> so lots of you know high pressure environment. And what I found my favourite part of that work was that these men would say. Hey, do you fancy a coffee or a drink after work? And that was code for something is wrong mm. and you feel safe. Mm. And so they would tell me about their, they were thinking of having an affair. They were having an affair. They were getting a divorce. They weren't sure their wife loved them. Their kid had just been diagnosed with autism. God, that happened so many times. And uh, uh, that was a conversation I had a lot. And, and it was just this feeling to me of, I both love that you have trusted me with this because some of these guys were, real alpha males, like often there was, you know, <laughs> it was a shock to me that they would sort of have three pints and then get around to the actual point of why <laughs> we were meeting. Um, <clears throat> but it always struck me, <clears throat> excuse me, it always struck me that that was a huge privilege that I had to be the receiver of their stories. And at the time I would do my best, right? Like all of us, I would try to be a good friend or I would challenge them or I would ask the right, you know, what I felt was the right thing or, or give them support, whatever. And I sort of, when I, when I finally kind of burnt out and decided I could not really go back into that environment and sort of retain my humanity. And I was looking at retraining. What I realized after the first day of my coaching training was that, um, I had been in the hole with them. So they were in a bit of a hole and I had crawled down with them mm. and I had basically sat there and kind of agreed with where they were. You know, and, and I'd done my best to kind of help them and everything. But it wasn't until I was trained and, and practiced a ton of how to actually help someone um, both honor that experience and also um, feel prepared and ready to move through that, which can take a lot of time, um, to acknowledge the complexity of all the other things that might be in the way for them to be able to move, uh, to recognize that, um, that they, they are, ne we are never in isolation, that there will be other responsibilities and things going on for that person, which means that, you know, saying things like just leap and build your parachute on the way down is the most ridiculous thing to say to a person. Yeah. Um, as is most inspirational quotes, by the way. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, but I think it, it wasn't until I had, you know, spent six months in some quite intense training that I recognized oh, this is why those things never resulted in anything mm. actually changing. This is why I kept having the same conversations with people over a period of months. Um, why they sought me out was because, yeah, they probably felt like I was a safe, trustworthy person to kind of come to. Um, it probably played into some gender stuff as well around emotional labor and what women do in a workplace mm -hmm. to take care of other people. Yeah. Um, but I think mostly um, – what I realized through the training was that uh, coaching is not being a good friend, right? Coaching is not um, helping people to, um, to, to kind of ask themselves obvious questions. And mm -hmm. I think that's where a lot of untrained coaches stay, right? It's they, they kind of become, you know, the, the pointers out of the bloody obvious, which can infantilize this work um, and it can often uh, patronize potential clients. Yes. And I think that that sense of not being heard is the worst thing that we can do to another human being, especially when we're coming from a place of perceived expertise. That's a really interesting dis distinction that well it's that spoke to me in having two coaches who are two separate coaches who and actually it's not even about them this is about me I know that I have a desperate need to be liked so when I coach if I don't have somebody who has like the clearest clearest boundaries I will push them because I want to be liked yeah and that's my that's my thing. So if if anyone is slightly the sort of person who, yeah, what is, I don't know. I don't even know what the, the kind of 
how to even phrase it. But um, so my first coach, Jen Carrington, who is absolutely amazing. I love her. She's so wise. Um, I was very much like, I just loved her. I loved her so much and then just wanted to be her. I wanted to be her friend. And I remember thinking, and we were pretty, yeah, we were pretty friendly. We are friendly. Um, But I do remember there was a point where I realised that I was now more obsessed with being her best friend um, than anything else because right. I would see, and I remember talking to her about this as well, yeah. um, that I would see her invite perhaps previous clients onto her podcast. And if I wasn't invited, I thought, well, that's it. I'm not good enough because I haven't been chosen. Right. And that's when I knew, okay, I can't, this coaching relationship isn't going to work because, and that, that was on me. That was a boundary that I had crossed or or kind of almost forced. Yeah. Or a boundary crossing that I had forced. I don't know if that makes sense. It makes so much sense, Luce. And um, I adore Jen too. And I know that she would totally understand this. Um, Cause she's, she is freaking wise. Um, and, you know, and Jen's come from that social work background. She mm. has a huge amount of empathy and understanding about boundaries and all that stuff. So I know this would not be um, a surprise or, or in any way about her. Um, and, and I think that's the other side of this is one of the things you learn when you uh, engage in training is that coaching is never about you as the coach, right? That coaching is actually about your your skills and expertise and and knowledge and training and all of that stuff distilled into your presence with a hum, living human who is sitting across from you or on the other side of a screen from you and both of you are working together to help create a future of your client that that you can both get on board with mm-hmm. and and that learning how to self manage like learning how to understand that when you are face to face with a, another human, they're going to say things that will trigger your own sensitive areas. Um, you might find that you're attracting in lots of clients who seem to have a similar kind of issue or a similar challenge that is something that you have not yet fully healed in yourself. And so you can feel like, oh God, I don't know if I can help them. Um, you might find you get angry or frustrated or bored with mm. your clients right? You may feel that you are overly invested in them reaching a certain expectation that you have for them. Um, all, the, all of that is present in that little conversation that happens between two humans. And unless you have had some some training and some understanding of what that experience is like and how to manage yourself so that you can, A, be, still be p- completely present for your client and do your own work to heal those blind spots and those triggers and work that stuff out for yourself. Um, it, it's like you'll, you'll reach a, a very self-imposed ceiling around who you're able to help and why and how. Yeah, I can really, really see that. I can really see that. And my background is psychology and counselling. So that was my degree. And yeah. the counselling part was the major. So I, as part of it, and it's kind of crazy when I think about it now that I was like 19 or whatever. And we had three different types of therapy every week as part of our degree, which was amazing. I mean, well, what a massive privilege to yeah. have had group therapy um, and two different types of individual therapy. And one of them was like a faux kind of supervision to kind of get mm-hmm. us um yeah so I am super comfortable with this type of relationship I guess like the therapeutic relationship so I feel like I can I I have the language and the tools and whatever to understand on an intellectual level what should be happening and when it's not happening why but it's but there's so many more people out there that um probably don't necessarily have that um those that skill set or haven't yeah. been privy to that kind of yeah that, like the well, that, side of things yeah I mean I think you're, you're speaking to something that I think is I see all the time with almost every coach that I work with and I have a mentoring group once a year that we work together for six months and it's all about kind of bringing your business to life but maintaining your like doing it in a way that isn't sort of 
um, that doesn't feel kind of sickly or uncomfortable, right? Mm-hmm. It's about kind of leaning into your skill set and bringing your business to life in that way. So we have this kind of um, mix of, you know, how are you showing up? Who are you reaching? And and how are you doing that? And how is your coaching evolving as a result of those things? Um and one of the things I have found with almost a hundred percent of the people I've worked with over the last few years is that coaches will come with a huge desire to help people like yourself. They will be trained in a coaching modality or in, <clears throat> excuse me, they'll be trained in a coaching modality or in a, um, you know, in a range of different tools or, or resources that they can offer people. And there is still this period, right, where we take that learning and actually apply it to the real world. And that's when we figure out, like, what works, what doesn't work. It's a huge experiment. It's a mm. way of sort of finding, you know, where is my place in this work and you know, who do I actually really like working with? What brings me alive about this work? And are there particular problems that I like to, ha- or challenges that I like to help people solve? Or um, is there a particular tool set that I really love to use? And is that my work? Or is it a particular person that you, or type of demographic that you like to work with? And so figuring that out, like what is going to make you feel the most excited as a coach to bring your work to the world um, is, is a huge part of that process. Mm. And I think when we're just starting out, we don't really know that yet. We just have an idea and often we want to be on the other side where it's all nicely packaged up and, <laughs> and you know, all sorted, right? We don't want to go through that that sort of valley of, um, you know, realizing that we have limitations or there are things outside of our experience or actually when you try this tool in real life, sometimes it doesn't work or maybe you have a client who's just looks great on paper, but in reality, there's no real chemistry. All of that sort of stuff is when you're finding your way. And what I find is that unless you have quite a bit of experience of playing in that experimentation place, um, and for lots of coaches, that means, you know, working for a nominal fee or for free in exchange for feedback, Mm. um, that that's when you kind of figure that stuff out. And so, I mean, it sounds to me like – you have a really um, in-depth understanding of these concepts. Um, and and then there is this little gap here of where does that get applied and how does that work and does that fit with my actual business now and, um, you know, how am I feeling about that? Is that actually bringing me alive? Well, yeah, that's it. I think um, from my point of view, the I would never want to be a coach and I don't offer any kind of – any kind of coaching but I I would love a coach again because I know I work I work really well with coaches but I've I've almost got the fear and I and to give a real practical takeaway I would love to get your and explore the best kind of practical tips for if you're looking for a coach because Mm. I now know what I would look for and this is maybe going to be personal for some people. It's certainly like I don't know if I would necessarily be able to give somebody a do this, this and this. But I think there are some universal truths that people would benefit from looking for or, or filtering when mm. they're picking a coach. Mm-hmm. Um, well, I think one of, one of the biggest things you can do as a client is to get very clear about what it is that you actually want help with. So regardless of who you're following or who you who you adore or who really lights you up or any of that stuff, like, um, yes, but is there is there actually a challenge that you have and can you name it? So right down to, for example, I really want to double my income next year. Yes. Or yeah. kind of getting really super specific. Yeah, and very specific. And I would say, um, so you make a great point. I want to double my income next year. The next question you ask, and why does this matter to me? Mm. And why can't I? Do, why am I unable to do this now? Like, why do I feel like I can't do this yet? Or what's holding me back from that? Right. So you get get quite clear on what you want. You get quite clear on why that matters to you and also on what might be in the way right now. 
And when you answer those three questions for yourself, you're going to have some a pretty good information around what might be holding you back, what is you know what it, what the reason for the goal is. Um, it might be an uncomfortable reason as well. Mm-hmm. Like I know a lot of when we start talking about money, people are like, "Oh, because then I'll feel worthwhile, right?" It's yeah. like, "Oh, actually, I don't know about that. I don't know if I like that. I, that is my goal." So these things might change. It might not be a once and done exercise. But I think if you spend a little bit of time with yourself, just getting kind of interested in your own experience of where you're at right now, where you want to be, and what's in the way, and then start thinking about okay, I'm going to be really interested in who might be able to help me. And it could be, um, and I I always say to people, like um, finding a a coach, finding a therapist, finding a mentor, um, finding anyone who can help you with your business, your life, your creativity, your relationships, anything, right, is a job interview. And Mm. you are the recruiter. So, you know, invite people to apply, So you may want to approach a few people that you see and you think, oh, actually, that feels good to me. And you can say to them, look, I'm interested in a coach for these reasons or I'm interested in a therapist or a mentor for these reasons. Um, I'd really like to have a chat to you. Most, uh, If anyone says that they they don't do an interview process or a kind of, you know, initial conversation – um, or if they have like a waiting list of a year or any of that, it's like, okay, well, you're, you're off the list. Yeah. Um, cause they, they can't help you right now, right? Then, or they're not willing to meet you where you are. Mm. Um, and so you, and you know, ask around, ask around in Facebook groups, in, um, you know, in the communities that you're involved in, ask your pals, uh, find out who people have worked with that feel good to you. Um, I, I always, if I feel like it's not a good ma- match for me with a client, I'll usually I will, um, refer them on to another coach. Because I've been around a bit and I kind of know, know a few pl- people, <laughs> mm, yeah. so um, so I'll always say, you know, um, you may want to consider these people, um, either because I'm full up or it doesn't feel like I can help you, or I know this person will is really in your corner um, in this problem or challenge that you're facing. Um, so most coaches will will think like that. Mm. But I think if you get really clear about what you need, why, and what's in the way, that's going to help you to get clear on who can help you. And and I guess in that interview process, the kinds of questions I would be asking um, is um, give, giving them a sort of brief rundown of where you are and what you know. And even if it's that, look, I want this, it matters to me because of this, and this is what I think is in the way. Can you help me? Um, I think one of the questions I would be asking is, have you, um, is this the kind of work you do? And what um, what are the typical response, r- results or responses that clients have? Oh, these are really good questions. Right? If, yeah. Because someone would who is able to be with your complexity and your unique situation is probably going to respond with well it differs for everyone but what i can tell you is this right and they'll give you a a sense of what to expect cuz most people ask things like how much does it cost mm. and do you work evenings yeah 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 the practical these are stuff. not important questions and and they are important questions but they're not as important as you know Am I going to be safe with you? Yeah. Which is really, I think, the question as a client you want to be asking. Mm. Do I feel safe with this person? I'm going to be revealing stuff about my business, about my life, my relationships, my past. Do I feel like that is held? Um, I, I nowadays, if I was looking for a coach now, I'd be asking, do you have supervision as a coach? Yeah. I think that's hugely important. Mm. And that tells you a number of things. It tells you that, A, they take this work seriously, that they are willing to invest in their own learning and development, um, and that they also recognize that they are still learning, right, and that they are willing to put themselves in a place of vulnerability in the same way that you are as a client. Yeah. So I would be asking for, you know, do you have supervision not do you have a business coach, right? Because most people have those these days. Yeah. Um, but do you have professional supervision? And what we're seeing is more and more of the kind of um, academic community are um, evolving and maturing is that coaching supervision is seen as a as a necessity. I mean, I have had various supervisors ever since I started because I've come from that background. Yeah. Um, 
but it's crucial. Yeah, it's yeah. absolutely crucial. Yeah, it's so important. And from my point of view, it, I, if I ever became a coach in any capacity, as I see it now, because I think when I start, when I when I offered coaching, blog coaching, I felt like it wasn't like what you do, you know? <laughs> yeah, but, well, you're yeah. at a different end of the spectrum, right? Yeah. yeah. And, and I guess that's the other thing to recognize is that actually for someone who is doing business mentoring, if they have a supervisor or not, may, may um, not give you enough information. Yeah, right. Absolutely. So, you, so um, for example, if someone is a marketing coach and they have no professional supervision, I would say that's probably appropriate in yeah. some ways because um, it may not have occurred to them. They may not feel that they need one or, you know, they, they are playing in the kind of business space. Yeah. So w- the question I would, the supplementary question that comes after that, I guess, is um, what happens when I, um, when I don't do the homework, when I don't follow this path like how you know do we just talk about what I need to be doing or is there space for me to fail to do this imperfectly to screw up to not do the homework and how do you address that oh that's juicy I would never have thought of asking that question ever but that's amazing because I think even in a business context, even if your coaching is in a business context or in a in that kind of mentoring training relationship, if there's no space for you to be a human, mm. then you, it's kind of not a safe space. Mm. It means that you will you will do things as a client and having been in this situation before where you kind of pretend, right, where you sort of find yourself, you know, bashing out the homework five minutes before the class Absolutely, starts. absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> And then you're comparing yourself to everyone else in the yeah, class, yeah. right? Or if you're working one-to-one with someone, you lie about what you've done and what you know. Right, right? yeah. And it's, I suppose... and it, it's how we keep ourselves safe. It's totally natural. But coaching is supposed to be a place where you can go and be your full self. Yeah. And explore yeah. the reasons maybe why you didn't do something that you were it's encouraged always, to do yeah it's always more interesting to look at why you're not doing it because I guarantee if you're not doing it for that coach you're not doing it elsewhere in your life and yeah. maybe that's a really interesting thing to talk about mm. and what about on the flip side for though for people who are thinking of becoming a coach you know whether it's a business coach whether you have e-courses like me or I guess you know anything really because it's all in the same sphere of helping people move past something um what advice would you give um I would say if you are in the business of helping people and um and you are finding that people are bringing more um of the emotional feeling side of things to their to the business courses that you might be offering or to the e-courses you might be offering then um there's two paths you can take. One is you can get yourself a coach who is going to help you have really good boundaries around this, mm-hmm. right? Because it may be that you don't actually want to go into the psychological reasons of abandonment why someone mm-hmm. can't just put their bloody marketing thing up, you know? <laughs> like it, it might actually feel like really kind of, oh, that's heavy and deep. And I just, I just want to help people put, you know, nice colors on their brand. That, that is that is beautiful. Honor that for yourself. But maybe you could do with some help to get really clear about how you can manage that for your clients. Mm-hmm. Um, so you could get yourself a coach. But if you are actually finding that you're really excited about that, like when people are bringing their stuff to things or when people are not able to um, – take action on the things you've agreed and you're finding that you're quite interested in that or you want to help them more, then um, having some training in in, in human behavior, and I, and I wouldn't want to limit that to just coaching it. There, may, there will be all kinds of things that are attractive around, um, around that to you. Uh, then that may be another feather to have in your cap. Mm. The thing about coaching skills is that it can't hurt anybody. Getting the skills can't hurt anybody. And you get better at lots of things, even if you never really apply this in your working life. Yeah. Um, it will, it will grow you as a human. Um, I, 
um, and just from personal experience, my husband, who has for years worked as a, um, he's a kind of a geek. I don't really know what he does if I'm totally <laughs> honest with you. Um, but he's been in the technology game for 20 odd years and he is a reflective introvert, quite, um, thoughtful, quite very smart, I would say, but don't tell him I said that. Um, <laughs> and he was like, why am I, why do I keep hitting this management ceiling that I can't, you know, young whippersnappers are leapfrogging over me. And, um, we talked about this and, and I said to him, babe, I think you really need to just get some coach training. I think it would really help you to kind of be prepared to, take some chances and some risks and, you know, just try some stuff out, be more comfortable in who you are and kind of give you some more resources to play with. Mm. And um, and so he went and did the same coaching training that I initially did, which was through the Coaches Training Institute, which is an in-person, live, very um, human, lots of um, lots of skills. It's a really well-respected course. It's quite expensive, but it's brilliant if you're committed to that kind of work. Um and as a result of doing that, he he is not a coach, but he is now a senior manager and he is, you know, using coaching skills every day on himself and with his colleagues, unbeknownst to them. <laughs> um, so, so I think this is the thing, right? It can help. These kinds of skills are about, you know, what do we do with all these feelings that we have? You know, how do I how do I manage through the world? Mm. This is, you know, for emotionally healthy people, coaching is ideal for that. Mm. Yeah, that's really interesting. And something that I will need to talk to you about offline. <laughs> I would love that. I could talk to you all day. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> Sadly, it is the end of the podcast. So where can everybody find your amazing self online? Uh, you can find me, I'm at Sass Petherick on Twitter and Instagram. And I'm at sasspetherick.com on the web. And everything else will be in the show notes. Thank you so, so much podcast total pleasure and you can find me at lucy lucraft everywhere but i mostly hang out on instagram you can find old episodes of what she said over at lucylucraft.com where you'll also find me chatting about all things blogging travel vegan life and zero waste living too lastly i know everybody asks this and it's a total pain in the ass but please think about leaving the show a rating and review it makes a huge difference to getting the show out to new listeners and for every review you leave i'll donate two pounds to charity so that's one pound for you and one pound from me the chosen charity changes each month so listen out for it in the intro each week thanks for listening